It's October 7th, 2022. We're in Studio 3 at Sunset Sound, and we're joined by two very special guests. To my left is Susan Rogers. Susan was a complete trailblazer for women in the engineering and studio world. She actually started as an audio technician right across the street here for Crosby, Stills & Nash Studio before working with Prince as an audio engineer at his home studio in Minneapolis all the way to Sunset Sound here in this exact room. To my right is Dwayne Tudor, who is a renowned author, has a complete set of books based on Prince's work that you've worked on for 20 years, roughly. Roughly, yeah. And we're going to get into all the books that both of you have now. But first, Susan, how does it feel to be back in Studio 3 here at Sunset Sound after decades and decades and seeing it still active and running? And Well, nothing makes me happier that it's active and running and popular as it should be. Yes. I mean, I was saying a little earlier today, there are no studios that I know of that feel more musical than this. There are great studios in the world. But when you go to a studio, you need to feel, if you're a musician... I can express myself here. I can express myself musically. Uh, It's not too junky and not too clean. It's not too sterile. It's not too perfect. It's not too imperfect. And Sunset found that alchemy when it was born 60 some odd years ago. And they were smart enough to never change it. Prince was a pretty intuitive guy. And when he discovered this studio, there was no other for him. Yes, he loved the way that Demidio console in there sounded. What else did he like about the room, too? I mean, obviously... Oh, goodness, you guys did such a good job of protecting his privacy. He loved that he could walk in, have his own room, his own bathroom. He loved the courtyard with the basketball hoop. Um, He loved that big, tall wall between him and Sunset Boulevard because Prince needed to be walled off. He liked to go out into the world and go to clubs and see what people were doing out there, but he wanted just a sliver of that so that he could come back into this womb and continue to create in this protected private environment. He really thought of it as his own room, you know, and uh, for better or worse, for you all, it must have been hard to. He was so capricious, and it must have been hard to allow him in when he called spontaneously and said, I want to record, I'm going to go to Sunset Sound tonight, and you may have had other clients booked. He really didn't want to hear that there were other clients in his room. Yes. I mean, Peggy would get those calls. Well, first, also, I wanted to mention that you were a full professor. Full professor. Berkeley College of Music, yeah. And now you've still consult and teach at classes online, but that was a big chunk of your life for the last 15 years. Mm Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. And a successful record producer has worked with David Byrne and Bare Naked yeah. Ladies. After uh, the engineering with Prince, you yeah. went on to record some amazing... I did all right. Yeah. And I'm a PhD. <laughs> Dr. Susan oh, Rogers. Dr. Rogers. So. That's what I'm calling you all day today, Dr. Rogers. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretentious. But it's sometimes, you know, with the kids, the students will ask, you know, how shall we address you? They're being polite because yeah. they're just meeting the teacher for the first time. And it might be professor or... They can call me by my first name, but on the first day, I I like to tell them, it's Dr. Rogers. Well, let's get into it. Let's talk about the neuroscience of creativity then. All right. You got it. Skip everything else. Let's get into that. I'm hyper creative. No, really? I I can't stop ever. After this, I'll go produce a record. Then me and that gentleman are doing overdubs tonight. And then it's, I'm producing a concert series and a television show. And I just, I can't stop. Mm. Mm. And it's, I'd love to discuss that with you. Maybe we should. I can tell you <laughs> how it works. Give me a, a brief little bit analysis of it. All right. Of hyper creativity. And it, uh, for your audience, it does it does concern Prince as well. Of course. So, creativity involves a capacity to kind of go into your own head. There's a neural network called the default network, and if you need to be creative, if you want to be creative, you stop focusing on external stimuli and you go into your own head. You daydream and you mind wander. Now, for some of us, we're lucky if any idea comes because creativity can't be forced. And even the most creative folks get writer's block. But for us us mere mortals, you think of something. When you think of something new, a brand new thought, it's filtered through a couple of little circuits here in the right hemisphere. The first one acts like a gate. So let's take myself, who I'm not a hyper-creative. I'm, I'm not especially creative at all. So I'm, I'm just your average, your average thinker. 
but I got to think of something creative. I got to design a poster for a show. Okay. And you open up that gate. And as soon as you get your first idea that's halfway decent, you say, great, I'm going to go with that. And you automatically shut the gate and you move it on from the art stage where creativity is to the craft stage, actually making the thing that you thought of. And you get busy with your craft and there you go. And then you evaluate your poster or your song or whatever. And and you're done with it. For a folk, a person who is uh, hyper-creative, those gates are broken and they stay open. So in a hyper-creative person, the ideas just keep coming and coming and coming. Now for most of us, that gate is there to separate relevant from irrelevant information. This is what's going to work for me, this is what isn't, and I'm going to close my mind to anything that I've already decided isn't going to work for this poster or this song. But in a hyper-creative they're open to all input. And they keep going and going and going and going and going because they have reduced inhibition. Those gates don't close. They have a leaky faucet. Um, Prince, being so facile with his leaky faucets, could think of ideas constantly throughout the day, at any phase of the day, and with his dexterity and his virtuosity on so many different instruments. Once he did transition from art to craft, he could work for hours. There was nothing stopping him. He didn't have to stop and wait for other musicians. He could play drums and keys and bass and guitar and vocals, and then the gate is open and more songs are coming. That's a hyper-creative. It's um, relatively rare. I've only known in the music business, I I've only worked with two of them. One was Prince, and the other is sitting right over there in that corner to my left. <laughs> in a hyper-creative situation, my friend Tommy here, We'd be working on a Gaggy Ta record. I'd be printing a mix, printing a mix. And Tommy would say, wait, because the ideas never stop coming. It's a, it's, it's, it's a rare uh, both gift and burden. I was going to say, can I ask a question about mm -hmm. that? Can the person that's hyper-creative ever be satisfied completely? You tell us, Tommy. <laughs> I, I, I think uh, Prince was satisfied uh, with the work that he did, of course, but that itch never left him alone. He was always feeling and experiencing, in the years when I was with him, I can't speak for his later life, th th those gates were always open and those ideas kept coming. Now Prince, as we know, was somewhat religious, and he believed that his talents were a, a gift and that he was obligated to honor that gift. So if he, if he thought of a song, he thought it um, lazy and disrespectful to God, I'm putting words in his mouth now, but disrespectful in a certain way to not get that song recorded right away, right now. Peggy and I would be in that room back there and we would have just finished a 24-hour session and it'd be six o'clock in the morning and this happened on the Sign of the Times album. Well, it happened on every album basically, but Six o'clock in the morning, we'd be wrapping things up, exhausted, bleary-eyed. He'd go to the bathroom, brush his teeth, walk back in, and he'd say the dreaded words, fresh tape. It meant we're going around again. But you enjoyed that. I, it made me laugh, and it made Peggy furious. Yeah. <laughs> Peggy had a life outside the studio. I had no other life. So uh, I, I would laugh with the joy and the pain of it. It was physically hard, and it was funny as hell, because who does this? It was yeah. exciting. It was thrilling. He had to win. I think even in, not just in the record industry, but in his mind. He, sure. Do you think he always had to, I've compared him to Michael Jordan, where he just had to win. He had to work. He had to constantly be doing it. Well, think about, here's, here's a kid from North Minneapolis. What are his... What are his chances in life? If you're highly intelligent and you're creative and you're sensitive, what are you going to be? What are, you, what are you going to be? It's up to you, son, because yeah. no one's going to give you a career or a college education or an opportunity or a life because you're a little guy whose name is Prince and you're in North Minneapolis. And on top of that, he grew up, and this is well documented, in a, in a home that was at times very abusive. So he's mentally, psychologically, emotionally, sometimes physically hurting pretty badly. So that's like taking a slingshot, all that pressure and all that pain, and that's pulling that slingshot back, 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 with the pressure of these abuses and this ambition. 
So by the time he got that record deal and he released that slingshot, he achieved escape velocity. He was able to escape the predicted life of a kid from North Minneapolis and have an entirely different life. And because that pressure was so great and he was so determined, that escape velocity was pretty damn fast. It shot him not just into stardom, but into superstardom. Yep. And once you're there, then, then what do you have to do? Once you're there, you have to make sure you live up to, to your promise. You have to achieve it. 100%. Um, for those who don't know, you were with Prince from 1983 to 1988, roughly? 87, yeah, late 87. So going on five years, you worked on Purple Rain, Around the World in a Day, Parade, Sign of the Times, and the Black Album. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously all the stuff that wasn't even released that you, oh, yeah. you went on tour with him even. Mm-hmm. And were, you were his personal engineer. I was his staff, yes. his staff engineer. Uh, I, when I left in 87, Paisley Park Studios had just opened its doors, and he could now work differently. He could have a staff of engineers. But at that time, he needed an engineer who was also a tech and could set up a studio at rehearsal or in a mobile recording truck or on the road, wherever we happened to be. And I, I had those skills. Um, going back just a little bit briefly, you started as an audio technician. Mm. And right across the street, this is such a monumental, historic little area where right. Sunset Sound is located at right here on, on Sunset Boulevard. But across the street is Crossroads of the World where there's tons of film producers, tons, tons of um, recording studios. And you worked for Crosby, Stills & Nash as an audio technician at their, was it called Rudy Studios? Um, everyone called it Rudy Records, but its correct pronunciation was Rudy Records. Rudy was a dog, and the logo is the dog sitting with its paw on a record. It, Rudy was a friend's dog up in Marin County, yeah. friend of David Crosby's. So, yeah, Rudy. David was just in, uh, well, he's always in once a year, but he was Great. in like three months ago for a month making a record. That's wow. good. And it's a fine, that. Mu- fine musician. That's what does it for me when the people that were here in the 70s come back and still, like yourself, have mm. such amazing things to say about that, uh, this place, and that's why they're here, because of these memories or the sound that they get off the Frank Domenio API or mm-hmm. the microphone collection. It's, it's so special. It's full circle, everything. When did you get the call to go to Minneapolis to work for Prince? So I was working across the street at Rudy as their studio maintenance tech. And... Uh, my then boyfriend, John Sacchetti, was a tech for Westlake Audio, just down the street on Santa Monica Boulevard. And uh, Glenn, Glenn Phoenix, president of Westlake, had gone into the tech shop one day and he said, boys, this guy Prince, Prince had just finished the 1999 album, he wasn't that well known. This guy Prince uh, put the word out, he's looking for a, an audio technician, he wants somebody to move to Minneapolis, be his full-time person. Uh, anybody know anybody? And right away, John Sacchetti said, yeah, Sue. He always used the Boston accent. He always called me Sue. Sue, she, she, she wants that job. Sue's perfect for that job. She loves Prince. And John called me and he said, Sue, your dream job is waiting for you. Prince is looking for a technician. And the instant he said those words, I knew instantly, tell him to stop looking because I'm getting that job. It's my job. I'm getting that job. And his management interviewed me and uh, they hired me. And I went, I, I hadn't met Prince, but I went out there and began working for him. So you arrive at the Kiowa Trail House or the Kiowa Galpin? Trail. No, it was Kiowa Trail. It was a house, uh, a suburban house in Chen House, and very close to where Paisley's located now. And uh, it had been painted purple. Uh, it's a little bit hideous. And it had, a, um, it had a big iron gate in the front, you know, with a call button and all that, which was unusual on that street, but his neighbors didn't mind. That's Minnesota for you. Personally conservative and politically liberal. Uh, they liked having him as a neighbor. So that's, that's where I went. And he had a, a studio, a small bedroom um, in that house. So the house was split level. It was, the front door was on a higher elevation than, than the back of the house. So if you walked in the front door, there'd be a landing right there with a half staircase to your right going up and another half staircase going down on your left. So if you went down the stairs, when you got to the bottom of the downstairs area to the right was prince's master bedroom and to the left was a, was a small bedroom like a, like a child's bedroom and in that room he had put in a console uh, ultimately it was an api console he had the big westlake monitors in the wall and he had a rack of outboard gear and he had a multi-track tape machine a great ampex mm 1100 
uh, and he had uh, his um, half-inch stereo tape machine, and that's where he did a lot of 1999, and that's where he did Darling Nikki, and uh, some of the songs that ended up on the Purple Rain album. This kid alone in his bedroom. Now, you tell the youth of today that, and they think, big deal. Doesn't everybody, you know, make records in their bedroom? <laughs> Not in the analog era, they didn't. And of course, you needed a technician to keep your gear running if you're working with those tools. Wow. Uh, obviously, there's so, so many amazing stories from the house, the studio, the warehouse, but we want to focus on Sunset Sound. Mm. When did you first come to Sunset Sound with Prince? Well... I don't remember exactly the first time I walked through those doors with Prince, but I do remember being a Prince fan before I worked for him, having his records, yeah. Controversy, and seeing uh, in 1999, and seeing on the back the name Peggy McCreary, and seeing Sunset Sound, and fantasizing. And I worked just across the street, but I had never been here. Oh, wow. So what a thrill it was to finally meet Peggy and to finally be in these rooms. And I, I was really afraid, would she like me? Would she be mean to me? Who is, who is this person? Is she going to resent me? You know, she, she, was, she was the engineer, and now he's bringing another woman along. And fortunately, Peggy and I are different enough that we, we complimented each other, and, and, and by the end of the day, we liked each other quite a bit. Sure. And as you've mentioned before, there was so much work to do that you complimented each good. other in that fashion it as well. It was good to have more than like, one person. There yeah. probably could have been four of you, and it still would have yeah. been running around yeah. crazy. Um, do you remember, though, what kind of what, what the session was, or were you coming off tour? Or? Oh, gosh. I, no, we wouldn't have been coming off tour, because he's in. when I joined him, he had just come off the 1999 tour, okay, so it right. would have been for Purple Rain. It was probably the spring of 84. Four, because you started August '83, mm -hmm. and they were filming. We did, yeah. We were in Minneapolis fall. in the so fall, probably in the early winter. January, February of '84. Yeah, I guess. early '84 yeah. would have been about right. And Peggy's obviously a staff engineer at Sunset Sound. She understands the rooms, the mics, everything we have here. Kind of the protocol of working in a studio full time. Whereas you're just your main focus is Prince and wherever he is, if it's touring or if it's at the warehouse or rehearsals, but she's used to Studio 3, the API Dominio, these mics and setup for Man. that. Um, do you remember what, ex we've got the work orders, obviously you've done books on the work orders. Do you remember kind of what was done here of Purple Rain? I mean, you know, the, Forgive me, but it was like 36, 37 exactly. years ago. And I'm trying to remember. I, I know we did a lot of post-production here for yep. the Under the Cherry Moon movie. And I, I may have come out in the fall with him for some post-production and incidental music for Purple Rain as well. But I can't remember for sure. I know we did a lot of that at home in Minneapolis. Anyway. Yeah, out here, uh, some of the songs that were done here include When Doves Cry. Yes. And Peggy was witness to that and the, the transition that that song went through. We discussed that. Peggy's, yeah. uh, she came in with David Z once and um, myself and Juizel Zappa sat in with her and she's just such a delight. And oh, like, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, you know, candid and also just a character. And like, yeah. she's funny and she's human. And, uh, you know, she, I don't think she ever, this was kind of a job for her. I don't think mm -hmm. she really just loved making records. I think she loves music, but I think it was kind of, Maybe even got turned off a bit after year two, three, and four. With it's a tough gig. It's a tough gig. And you do sacrifice a lot. Peggy uh -huh. did opt to have, to have a husband and have children. And, and that's very rewarding. Yeah. And um, for m many of us, myself and Sylvia Massey, Leanne Unger, and others, uh, we forego having children in order to continue to make records. But I remember, uh, I know that some of, or a version of Computer Blue was done here, but we did quite a few versions of Computer Blue at home in Minneapolis. So Prince was still working on the arrangement of some songs. Other songs were done completely in Minneapolis, like Let's Go Crazy right. and Darling Nikkei. Right. Did you do Take Me With You at all? Yeah, we that did Take Me here, With You here. And yeah. that was February or January of 84. Mm. Uh, the Time Stuff, some of the... For, oh, a lot of that. So that was done yeah. here. Apollonia 6, mm -hmm. that was done here during yep. January, February of That whole 84. period. Yeah. Yes. So that makes sense, yeah. Oh, yeah. Plus, that, we have master tapes days. of him playing piano, and he's going through and writing these songs. Jeez. A lot of them just kind of, you hear bits of them and the piano, and it's like him sitting there for four hours. Don't you love that when he was noodling around on the piano, he wanted something to be in record? Yes. That 
that this man was not the least bit shy about his musical outputs. Um, Duane and I did an event last night where a question was, how do you think he would feel? How would Prince feel about this material that's coming right. out now? And I, I honestly do believe he knew what he was doing when he hit that record button. He was proud of, of what he did and wasn't shy about documenting his creativity, his ideation. When you... <clears throat> first met Prince, he was very standoffish. He kind of didn't come down and even introduce himself, did he? Yeah. He was like, this needs to be done, this needs to be done. And weren't you like, hey, <laughs> I'm Susan. Nice to meet you. Yeah, that was my first conversation with him. So I'd been working with him, or for him, I should say. I'd been in his employee for uh, about a week, as I recall. I'd been w come in, walk into the house through the garage, and the back door entrance, go into this studio, do my work, and go home at night. I was installing a new console and doing some repairs for on his equipment. I didn't see him. I could hear him upstairs with um, Vanity Six and some of his band members taking meetings and planning Purple Rain because they all had to take acting lessons, and I could hear them laughing and talking and dancing, and, and that sounded like fun, but I didn't meet the guy. And uh, I was finally finished, so I called Sandy Scipioni, who was his personal assistant, and I said, Sandy, I'm done. Can you tell him? And she called him and said, all right, she's done downstairs, and Prince came downstairs, and he didn't even introduce himself. Uh, he came downstairs, and I remember I was standing on the landing, and he was just a few steps above me. And he just right away asked, what about this? What about this? What about this? And asked several questions, and I answered his questions. And he said, um, okay. And he said something like, you know, you can come back tomorrow at some time or something like that. And he turned to go upstairs, and there was a little voice in my head that said, don't let it start like this. Don't, I just moved, you know, 2,300 miles. I left every human being I knew on Earth to come here it's not going to start like this. And I, I interrupted him. And I said, excuse me, Prince, I'm Susan Rogers. And I stuck my hand out <laughs> to shake his hand. And he got, there were times when he'd get this look on his face where he wants to laugh, but he knows he probably shouldn't. And this was one of those times, like he thought that was very formal and very funny. And he said, I'm Prince. And we did this kind of little shaking hands and bowing. And uh, we just kind of, yes. Incredible. Like, like two diplomats, you know, meeting each other. And I thought to myself, good, good. I, 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 was, I was glad I did that. Because in essence, it's saying, you're my boss, I'm your employee, and that's our relationship to one another. I can quit at any time, you can fire me at any time. But, you know, in addition to that relationship is the human relationship. And I want to make sure we've got both. That human relationship doesn't need to take precedence, of course. But I want it to be known that I'm aware of it, yeah. as we all should. That's good for you to stand up to. That mm. probably made even the working relationship better in the coming years. To just that mm. little encounter where you're like, "Yeah, I need to be recognized." Let's be people exactly. first, and then I'll do my job. You can trust me. I'll do my job. Probably some kind of game too, where he would even wonder if you were gonna kind of stand up for yourself or say hi after a minute he was funny about people and, yeah. and i'm sure you'll hear others have told you similar stories he kind of knew often from the get-go if he was receptive to knowing them or not he and for many people he he was absolutely not receptive to knowing them and there are stories of that happened right here in this room behind me of him um being introduced to very famous accomplished musicians and him ignoring them. Off subject, who was the musician that asked you to meet Prince? That he came in here and Prince would not say a word to I can't, him. I won't say. I, I wouldn't want to embarrass this person. It okay. was extremely awkward. It was someone I knew and uh, someone who is a legend in his own right. It wasn't Eddie Van Halen. No. Okay. Because no. Van Halen would have been in here uh, uh, in the later records no, at the same it, time. No, it wasn't that. But this might be an embarrassing story for sure. this person. No, I'd I don't want to do that. that I was he just... tell it. But anyway, famous musician comes in and tries to start a conversation with Prince. Prince reluctantly said yes to me when I said, you know, please. And uh, Prince said, okay. And then this guy came in and uh, started to make conversation with Prince. And Prince didn't even respond to him. I mean, wow. just really supremely rude. Yeah. yeah. And, and not even shy about it, just, just yeah. flat out rude. And the guy, uh, I remember the guy kind of looked at me like, and then looked back at Prince and said, well, I'll let you get back to it then, you know, and left the room. It was utterly uncalled for, and who knows what made Prince behave that way. He could be such a, he could be a brat. Sure. He, could, he could be a 13-year-old 
depressed, immature, small-minded. He on was occasion, still young too. You know, and it's he was like, young. isn't the human brain not even fully developed till you're 26 Ooh, years that's old? True. And it's like, true. yeah, the bolts and the nuts and the wires aren't fully tightened down yet. You you have some screws loose uh, until you're a little bit older. He could also be the most amazing. Um, caring person especially with children and with charities where you didn't even want the press there very much and so. he did a lot of gr i've heard from numerous engineers staff that he would do big bonuses and a lot of very yep. cool things get the bonus check so yeah. it's like you know we hear this very determined kind of tyrant at some points but also there was the other side that was a yeah. such a contrast he had a very loving heart but think about it i try to wrap my head around this and imagine what it would be like you get signed to a record deal when you're 18. You're mm -hmm. a millionaire probably by the time you're 20. When I met him, he had just turned 25. 25-year-old with employees, with a complex, I mean, a, a, a record-making complex right. in a manner of speaking, with a lot of money, more money than he would know what to do with. What is it? What, is mo what do most 24-year-old, 25-year-olds do with that money? Stupid stuff. A lot of stupid stuff. <laughs> there's a, a lot of bacchanalia. There's a lot of drug use. There's a lot of really horrible, impulsive behavior because you're young. But not that man. He was smart enough to put his money into his work. His money went entirely into music-making tools and into, into achieving his dreams. So the pressure's got to go somewhere yeah. Think of the pressure of that when you lay down and put your head on the pillow at night and you think, I'm 25 years old and I'm giving orders to a guy who's 35 and my management who's 45 and 55 and I'm 25 years old. What kind of guts does it take to say, keep your hand on the tiller and do this? And I used to love when he would say, he'd be talking about some dilemma, regarding decisions to be made and he would say we got to do it this way we put bread on people's tables yeah. he took that very seriously we put bread on people's tables i have employees that's why he would give us those bonus checks he, he wanted to know i'm working hard you're working really hard for me and i want you to see some fruit from that tree as well yep noted um, let's walk through a day here. And also, you know, what's so fascinating is that when you started to work for Prince, it was at such a pinnacle moment for him in his career, his personal life. It was right at the beginning of Purple Rain, and his whole life would change where he would go into the stratosphere of stardom, of his creativity, of his notoriety. Um, how did you notice him changing over just that first year you were with him? That was um, an interesting psychological change. His life changed drastically. When yes. I joined him, it was not guaranteed that Purple Rain, the movie, the album, the tour, any of it, would be successful. He had just had a peak at 1999, and after a peak usually comes a slump. Mm -hmm. uh, but he had such such confidence in himself. He he was so happy in those days before that before that album came out, and on that tour he was happy. He won an Academy Award and was happy. He won a lot of Grammys and American Music Awards and was so happy. But the release and the success of Purple Rain did put him up there. Now he's at the top echelon of music makers in the United States. It was Prince, Michael Jackson, and Madonna in the 80s. And Madonna was right on his heels, and he knew it. He wasn't so scared of Michael Jackson, but he, he knew. He used to say, when a woman comes along and does what I do, she'll rule the world. Well, he knew. He saw her in the rearview mirror. Mm -hmm. Madonna was right, coming right up behind him. So after that, after you know you've hit superstar status once and you've been called a genius and your record is a masterpiece, now the question is, can you do it again? Or are you one of those artists who just has one in you? Can you do it again? So, so, so... What's the problem you got to solve? If you deliberately, consciously try to create a masterpiece, screw yourself up. Because the first one didn't come from consciously trying to create a masterpiece. It just came from expressing yourself. So what do you do? How do you, how do you, how do you tap that magic formula a second time? Or 
Do you say, no, I'm not even going to try for masterpiece status. I'm just going to be an artist, come what may. And that's what he did. Yeah. And he pursued his artistry with, of course, Around the World in a Day, which we did before his record, uh, Purple Rain, was released. And then uh, the Parade album was intended to kind of go back to black and white, as he did with Dirty Mind, go back to being a pure artist who appeals to the, the critics and rebuilding the same arc. He changed both personally and artistically enough that Quite by happenstance, Sign of the Times became his second acknowledged masterpiece. Oh. And, and he knew exactly what was going on in, in current music, and also he used shock tactics. I mean, Dirty Mind put him on the map mm -hmm. for being shocking. Mm. Um, he goes into controversy, which we get the tail end of that here, and it shows his musicianship where he plays everything. Well, he always plays everything. But then he gets the hit with Little Red Corvette, correct? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the big hit that puts him His kind first of a crossover. crossover. Single, yes, yeah. exactly. Then it's let's go bigger with a film, even now. And how old was he even when he pitched the idea? 23? 24 years old. Yeah, yeah he would have been 24 years old at the oldest. He could have been younger. But. Exactly. And and how great of Warner Brothers to to green light that? What foresight those folks had to know they fought it though. This could work, but ultimately yeah, but they did. They did prove it right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But they, they, their vision of it was much smaller mm. of what they imagined. And the stories that sure. supposedly Sylvester Stallone, they wanted him to play the prince character. In the Can you imagine that? Oh, no, no. It, it's just insane thinking about that. Hey, how Apollonia. Sm <laughs> how smart of Prince <laughs> Say, to fight for what he knew would work. How smart of him to do that. Which is what friend. Sylvester Stallone did with Rocky. Yeah. He said the same thing. He said, you know, I'm not going to let somebody else take this not role. Gonna, yeah. People stand in yeah, and Big people out there were the ones that did that and threatened to lose it all to stand up for their art. Did you ever see a common thread in Prince? Obviously, we, we know there's no formula to kind of making a hit. And even our mutual friend Greg Wells will say the same thing. Um, I actually told him you were coming in today. But have you seen or did you see a common thread with Prince on how his hit songs, there was something that was done on those sessions that he didn't do on other ones? Or was it just kind of... I think this is great. I yeah, know it is. Yeah, this is a funny thing. Um, Prince used to say, we make albums, not singles. Exactly. He was not focused on singles. He was obsessed with albums. And the experience he wanted his fans to have was, in the days of vinyl, 37 minutes or so of side A and side B of a 37-minute and later on CDs, you know, 45, 50 minutes of a story. Yeah. But in that, you know, you have you have you have to deliver something to radio, so you got to have a single. And he would he would actually just sort of try to guess which records radio might like the best of the records that are appearing on this album. And he was often wrong. I think um, it's well known among Prince fans that his two biggest commercially most selling all right back up <laughs> i'd like to buy a vowel his two <laughs> biggest records in terms of commercial sales were nothing compares to you and kiss nothing compares to you i remember when we when, when he wrote it and we recorded that at the warehouse gave it away to the family and kiss he very nearly gave away and after he heard the production on it decided to take it back so he wasn't always intuitive about which of his songs were destined to be pop hits and the flip side of that was he kind of believed that uh, if i was your girlfriend was destined to do well on radio and it did not he thought a door on sign of the times would do well on r&b radio it did moderately well but it, w it wasn't as big as the other more pop things yeah he didn't always know but it, i think that's because his focus was not on singles it was on crafting albums he was the book not the chapter exactly oh. yeah. yeah you know one of the reasons of this show is obviously to document the studio because it's just so amazing. But two, it's also to educate. Uh, the kids today don't really know about a lot of this stuff. They know maybe a few Prince tracks, but to know him as an artist and how he uh, put records together with the assistance of all, all this amazing staff he had around him was just mind-blowing because he played all the instruments. He'd run the, the console, he'd edit, whereas uh, no, his competition... Hang on, I don't remember him editing. 
He didn't edit. In fact, I tape? once offered to I, I once offered to hand him the razor blade, and because he was hovering right over me, and as I was editing, and and I said, "Want me to show you how to do it?" And he just went like that with his hands, okay. and then he said, "Piano player." David Leonard would come in and cut tape. I just, would cut tape. Oh. <laughs> oh, no, that's offensive to me. Yeah. So, Sorry. So, um, Peggy told me the story that, and I know I interrupted you because you had a question, but I, I want to get no. the record straight. Uh, Peggy would edit for him, and sometimes she'd be exhausted, and you don't trust yourself cutting that tape. So uh, she would call David, who David Leonard worked here at the time, and David would come and do it, and, and Prince knew David. as His nickname for him was The Blade. But when I came along, I mean, come on, I couldn't sure. edit the tweeter off a mosquito's ass. I mean, <laughs> I, 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 was, I was good at what I did. It took him a minute to recognize, yeah, women can edit. But, you know, once... Once he knew that, yeah. there was no need to call in David Leonard when I could do it as well or, God damn it, better. So let's just put that out there. Perfect. That, and that's another reason <laughs> we do this roundtable is to yeah. get facts and yeah. really and document science. like your book. My point of the story is Prince did everything musically. He played all the instruments, and he was such an amazing arranger, and obviously with only 24 tracks at that time, too. But he, Michael Jackson had everything. He had Westlake Village. He had Quincy Jones. He had people Bruce collaborating. Sweden. Yes, mm. Bruce. He had so much, and it's it was all Prince when it came here. You know, it was him in a room, creating this amazing sound music. And Prince also, you know, was notorious for saying, "If the groove is there, nothing else matters." True. So when you, Peggy, Lisa, every engineer, David, Bill Jackson, who worked with him for a month on Around the World in a Day. When you would come into the room, what would he uh, start with? The Lynn drum, a drum set, depending on what he was working on, sit around on the piano for a little bit? Well, his favorite way to work was to have everything set up and routed so that he could work silently because he didn't like small talk. He, it interrupted that flow, that river, that Niagara Falls of ideas that was coming through his brain. It interrupted that flow if he had to have conversations. So if he could start a session with everything set up and routed, just headed to tape, happy, happy, happy. Um, sometimes you'd get a phone call saying, here's what he wants set up. Sometimes you'd come to the studio and there'd be a note waiting on the console saying, here's what he wants set up. If it was sunset, he would tell the front desk, tell the engineers, I want this set up. But you come in and uh, try to get as much routed for him, get his bass tuned, get his guitars tuned before handing it to him. Never so hand that, him an untuned instrument. Never hand him an untuned instrument so that he could move from one instrument to the other. He would stand at the drum machine, get a sound up. He had his Roland Boss pedals with flanger and delay and chorus and heavy metal and distortion and all the effects that he liked. He could, he could add those into the mix and he'd program his drum machine and we'd roll tape. Kick drum, snare, claps on a separate track, and then the mix coming out of the little mixer that was built into the drum machine, and that would be routed through the uh, effects. So he had his unique sound that would take up four or five tracks, sometimes six at the most, and then he'd lay down the bass and the chord changes with a keyboard pad or something like that, and basic basic parts. But I've uh, I've said that he had a watchmaker's knack for understanding how to complete an arrangement with the limitation of 24 tracks. So when you have fewer ingredients, just like a master chef, each ingredient has to carry more weight, which means each ingredient has to be more pure. Its, it's flavor has to, be un, it has to be independent from the other flavors. If you're, if you're a top chef, and he was a top arranger, and he once said, evidence of this is that he once said to me, in theory, any instrument in the mix should be capable of being the loudest thing in the mix. Uh -huh. Nothing should ever be in the background. Now, that applied to his arrangement style. After I left Prince, I had to unlearn Prince because if you tried to take his arrangement approach to a mix with a different kind of artist, it wouldn't work. Other people constructed something that was more like a pyramid. His was more like a sphere. You could move your spotlight of attention pretty much anywhere on most Prince records Focus on any instrument you want and get a treat. Yeah. No instrument was dependent necessarily on others. That's a unique way of arranging. Not everyone arranges like that. But he, he, he had that musical mind that was almost, almost like a kaleidoscope where you could rotate your perspective on this record and it would work 
You mentioned the groove being the most important thing. Another thing he taught me was if a mix is working, you should be able to mute all the vocals and the whole top line, melody and, and the hooks and things like that, and it should work with just the rhythm section. Your sounds and your performances should be strong enough that you could do a breakdown on the dance floor and no one wants to stop dancing. That record doesn't lose pressure. Yeah. Wow. And, and that, that was hard to achieve with other artists, but for him, that's how he thought musically. So he built his records that way. I just interviewed Jeff Barry, who was an amazing songwriter with Phil Spector. They did Be My Baby with the Ronettes and just all this stuff. And I'm a musician as well, and I write songs. And I was talking to him about how I create the groove first and then the melody. Mm. And for his whole career, he always thought of an idea and the melody, and then they would yeah. put music to the melody. Yeah. But Prince would get the groove going and then come up with them. Not always, no. No, uh, not on always. His, on his ballads, on, on ballads and, and uh, well, things like Computer Blue or... I think the song Pop Life, written on piano first, where yeah. he'd have melody and he'd, he'd write out his lyrics and then he'd come into the studio with lyrics already written and he knew the melody, he knew the chord changes, he knew the sections, and then he would do the drum track and, and build it up from there. It was only the dance stuff that started with rhythm and then piled on top of it. But other times he worked from the top down, yeah. from the melody down to the rhythm. Sure, okay. And he loved his Mesa Boogie amp. For guitars, correct? That was his choice, yeah. The funny thing about that is people often uh, in interviews will talk about him being experimental with his sounds and stuff, and I would always say, no. <laughs> absolutely, it was absolutely the opposite. Because he was so creative, he needed his methodology to be pretty, a uh, pretty narrow lane. Because if he had been, if his creativity had drifted outside of those lanes to finding new guitars and new guitar sounds and all new keyboards and all new drum machines. It would have taken, it would have tapped resources that were being devoted to songwriting. So he, 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 he wanted his tools to stay exactly the same because he was so hyper creative with the same tools, he could draw and paint for years. Is it, sorry, is that why he would keep the drums on the first three or four tracks? And then go to the bass on the on the on the board when he was doing the. Um, oh sure, but yeah. I think I think a lot of us yeah, did okay. that. Yeah, okay, that was pretty common. Would he actually mix everything, or with were you guys co-mixing songs? That's another thing. Uh, he, he was very hands-on on the console, and he loved the Demidio console here because it was um, easy easy to work with, very musical in sound, and uh, ergonomically designed to be easy to work with, but. Um, I joined him as a technician, so I did not have an ear of my own. He taught me his ear. Yeah. So increasingly, as the time went on, I was able to do more and more of dialing in the sound the way he liked it. And then eventually, of course, my own artistry, such as it was, filtered through. And so by the, by the last year we had together, he was allowing me to do an awful lot more of that. He would often say, for example, <clears throat> pardon me, um, this is the song I want to work on, something that had already been partially recorded, put up, put up the record, get a mix on it, and then I'm going to come in and I'm going to change the vocals or something like that. So uh, that was a chance for me to be more creatively involved. Yes, wow. Do you remember anyone coming in besides, you know, the usual suspects of the revolution, et cetera, but artists that came into this room to collaborate, co-write, do anything with him? I mean, I know he did everything. He liked to be by himself and work that way, but was there like, did Michael ever come down here and hang? Not in my memory. Yeah. Others may have, may have witnessed that. Now, I saw Prince with Michael in Los Angeles, but it wasn't here. It was doing post-production for Under the Cherry Moon on a soundstage. Um, I remember uh, the Bangles coming in and recording a song right here in this room with the Bangles and Wendy and Lisa and Sheena Easton sure. coming down. I remember him talking on the phone to Madonna, but I, I don't have a memory of her Stevie coming Nicks, down. Stevie Nicks, they would hang out a lot. Yeah, and again, I, I don't have a memory of that. That could have happened, and yeah. uh, in order to form memories, you need to sleep, and that was something I didn't do a lot of. So it, actually, that could have happened, for all I know, and I don't, but I don't remember it. Well, Chaka Khan is another one that I believe came down at that time. I just uh, worked on Rufus Wainwright's record in Studio mm -hmm. 2, and Susanna Hoffs came in, and she's going to come on this, too, to talk oh. about, obviously, Manic Monday. You worked with Apollonia 6, and did those records here or Sound Factory? 
I remember very few sessions with Prince at Sound Factory. Well, you were I think they were, they were here. There was Apollonia 6 stuff mm-hmm. was in February of 84 here, and I think in 3. We did quite a lot of that at home as well, at home, in, in, in Kiowa yeah, Trail. Yeah, the, uh, the last songs or two, uh, Happy Birthday, Mr. Christian, was done at home. And uh, I remember else. working on that at the warehouse in Minneapolis as well. Yeah, that might have been where it was done. I know it was done in Minneapolis. Prince yeah. wrote Manic Monday himself, Yeah, he correct? wrote Manic Monday, but he, he did Manic Monday here and that was during the time he did uh gosh what blue metal blue limousine blue limousine i think was done in here most of that album was done within a week i mean yeah he had a really crunch time for like a week or two where he just kind of focused on that he was the sole writer of manic monday uh, yeah I mean, I, 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 he might have been inspired i mean the thing is and there's always people inspired him susan uh, susanna melvoin inspired you know songs and Different people inspired different songs for him. I I don't know when it comes to writing. I wasn't yeah. in the room. I, I was. Say. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Peggy and I uh, compared notes on this, and we have very different memories of this, which is alarming to us both. But we were at home in Minneapolis, and I had a night off, a rare night off. He, Prince was going out. He was going to First Avenue or something, so I had the night off. And I went out. I had a date. And I wore something nice to go on my date because it was the 80s and I was a young woman. And uh, sure enough, I come home from my date and I get that phone call that says, uh. Susan, can you come down to, the, down to the warehouse where our API console was? And I didn't have time to change clothes or anything like that. So in my nice clothes, I went flying down to that warehouse. And I got in there in a, in a bit of a huff because it was so rare to have a night off and to actually go out on a date and be interrupted by that. But, you know, whatever, he called, and so I came down in my more fancy clothes. And uh, I remember him getting that notebook and writing. It was 6 o'clock already. I was just in the middle of a dream, kissing Valentino by a clear blue Italian stream. But I can't be late because I guess I just won't get paid. These are the days when you wish your bed was already made everything, if you're a writer, everything inspires you. So uh, your employee rushing through the door, disheveled and just in a little bit of a huff, trying not to be late, but, you know, obviously dressed up for a more romantic evening, um, I believe was the genesis of that. I, I, I remember that, and I remember quite a lot of other songs that we did at that time. It was a very fertile period for him. Peggy remembers doing Manic Monday here. It's possible... We did it two places. It's possible we did it at home with so many other songs at home in that warehouse in Minnesota, and that we also did it here as well. Sure. This is the thing I'm finding with a lot of the songs you're asking about who wrote them and stuff. A lot of it is the inspiration of things, like you were just saying, or where this thing came from. If you've got a machine where you're feeding the time, Apollonia 6, the family and stuff like this, there's going to be tons of different inspirations for things. Exactly. Like, and every sentence you say to the guy or every joke you say to the guy has the potential exactly. to be in a song. So inspiration can come from you know anywhere. And then I think Jill Jones had said, just because a song may be about this person doesn't mean it's not about that person and this person and yes, that person too. Yes, it's an aggregate, yeah. 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 Uh, and inspiration takes over. Uh, after you, The fruit can fall very far from the tree. Right. So you've got the original seed of, oh, there's my employee. I bet she was on a date. And after that, it's just pure imagination. Right. You can't say a song was about yeah. any one person. Nothing compares to you. It, there's like three or four stories about where that potentially came from, and you know, Prince would be the only one that could answer. And even he wasn't always sure. He wasn't always uh, uh, he was a little evasive about what, where the inspirations came up for do on that. Yeah, and kind of as we should be, because why do we need to know? Right. That's what's it. What's it matter? We all want to know, but I understand exactly what that. Yeah. I think that I think knowing we're all curious who the Carly Simon wrote the song about, you know, and things like that. But it, would that answer anything? It's like seeing the magician secret. Yeah, I don't exactly. know if I want to know because it might make the spe- song less special. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I agree. Uh, we like, we, 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 part of the book that I've written is about that, is what music does once it becomes ours in our own heads. And that's part of the life of music is <laughs> the new life, the second life it takes on. When when we're listening to it, it becomes what we think yeah. it is. I think there's a quote by Prince that says something like, "Once the song is out there, it's yours." It's yours. Yeah, and mm-hmm. that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't get royalties off of the song. Just, 
it is mine. Yeah. You know? Well, also since it's passing, though, just finding out the actual factual information, because back in those days, there's no cameras, the there's thing. no social media, right. there's none of that going on, and it's like, who was in the room? Who wrote these songs? I'll you know, tell you this, everybody the, claims yeah. they've written everything now, and it's One of the bullshit. trickiest thing about this thing is, is when I'm doing these books... So I, I, when I first started doing the first uh, book, I started interviewing Peggy, I think right around 1990. So this is when I started these things. And she said, I don't know. This happened six, seven years ago. And I didn't know some jerk was going to come in here and ask me a question. I don't think she used the word jerk. But we laughed about that. Now she's like, I don't know. That was 40 years ago. So it's like this stuff is, you know, and, and, and also, like you said, you had no sleep. You're working. I find that the, the more... Um, I don't say accurate, but the more detailed stuff is often from people who work from for three sessions, and that's it, because they remember those very those well. Those are so vivid. Yeah, whereas yeah. you've got 100 sessions, dunk, 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 three or four songs in a day, that's that's tough to remember, because yeah. you can only hold so much, especially when you're tired. You, just start, you have to start flushing. I directed TV shows, and I'll see people out there and go, I don't know if you're my TV friend, <laughs> or if I met you on the set, or if you're on a show I watch. And I've had times where I was, I was cutting a movie, and I'll see an actor at the rap party, and I'll start talking to him. Hey! And he's looking at me, who, who the hell are you? I'm like, oh yeah, I've been staring at your face for the past two months. I, I didn't know that we didn't know each other. Because my brain was just yes. like, I've seen you, hmm. and not just seen you in the scenes, in the outtakes. So you're, you're, I, uh, to me, I've, I've spent time with him. Yeah. And that's like Johnny Carson. You said people felt very comfortable with Johnny Carson because they were in their bedroom. Yeah. So I think true. that, you know, um, yeah. I, and, uh, but in the book, I've had times where there was a, a part where Jesse Johnson was saying one thing and Sheila was saying another thing. And I have to say, this is what Jesse says. This is what Sheila says. And I have no idea because I wasn't there. Right. And, and I want to make sure that their voices are heard because... Just because there's people that contradict somebody doesn't mean it didn't happen. Right. And it was a chilling moment. It was in San Francisco on an engineering prints panel when Peggy and I looked at each other and we both... Well, I think it was Peggy first was asked a question about Manic Monday on the panel and she described the session. I had to go up to her afterward and say, Peggy, you got to tell me more about this because that's that that's completely contradicts my memory of it. And we, I remember us both looking at each other saying... I don't know, because we could be conflating, sure, you know, different sure, songs. Sure, We're doing yeah. the best we can. Yeah, huh? and and you weren't like you said, you weren't taking a diary, you weren't taking notes. It was like, gosh, I hope I remember this, you know. And the, I didn't the timeline. Even think that. This is this is one of the things I enjoyed with the book is putting the things in context. And Susan's great at this, saying, this is where he was in a relationship. This is where he was emotionally. He had just gotten, you know, the the last bomb movie bombed, you know. So you can kind of see the tone shifting yeah. and that when you can see that sort of stuff in, in context um, and there's a the Beatles the, studio session book that does the same thing and that you kind of look through that and you go Brian Kehoe's book yeah there's a yeah. number of books like that yeah and you just go through and you go oh that's why they're like this that right. explains this lyric oh so this song is about a Paul McCartney's dog okay you know and, and so that kind of stuff is fun but yeah it's all subjective too it was also a big thing for Prince psychologically to turn 30 I think in in eighty seven and and uh, with the revolution having broken up, with his engagement to Susanna Melvoin having broken up, he's about to turn thirty, and a non trivial matter, rap music, mm. a tidal wave of a new style of music is about to crash on dance funk. So what do you do if you're thirty years old and they're telling you it's time to leave the party? Hit the bricks, son, because another style of music is coming along. What do you do? It 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 is it astonishes me and it touches me emotionally to recognize that under those conditions he created his second masterpiece. Well, let's let's come back to Sign of the Times because I think that's an amazing record. Obviously, that you had such a pivotal part in, and it was done here, uh, the majority of it, but. Can we go back to Purple Rain just for yes. one moment to stay on, on a little bit of a timeline? Um, and the production also is just, you know, we're in a, a studio. The engineers want to know. He would do a Mesa Boogie amps. You like the Sennheiser 421s on mm -hmm. that amp. The Neumann 47 was his favorite vocal mic. Um, what would you use on the drums? 
the Yamaha drums. Oh, um, the usual stuff. Yeah, nothing crazy on <laughs> The usual or... stuff, you know. It was a 57 on the snare during the Prince era for me, and I changed that later as my career progressed. That wasn't my go-to for the snare, but yeah, it was the 57s, the Sennheiser 441s, the 421s. I like a 421 on a kick. Uh, Prince liked the Yamaha drum kit, like Yamaha pianos. Yamaha drum kits have a, a, a wonderful sound for pop recordings. They're just wonderful p- for pop. He used the Remo, uh, the clear oil-filled pinstripe heads on the drums, yeah. and they just had a boink to them, which was, was quite nice. A uh, pair of AKG 414s on the overheads, and um, the usual stuff. Yeah, the, the AKG, um, oh no, no the, the KM84 probably on, on a hi-hat. Yeah, just gotta have, have to get a few engineering questions in there. Of for course. The, uh, yeah. The. Uh, oh, and let's give a, uh, some props to Countryman. It's got to be a Countryman direct box on his bass. Other basses, the Jensen transformer, but no. on his bass, Countryman DI, and on his clean guitar, they've got and a great the sound. The Honer guitar in here. Yeah, Telecaster copy. Yep. A Telecaster is a hard instrument. Guitar players tell me it's a hard instrument to play. Props to Bill Frizzell. Um, Prince at that time, when he was young, uh, worked with his honer and 11 gauge strings, big thick ones. But he had that dexterity in his left hand, and, and that wasn't hard for him. I'm told that as he got older, he switched to a lighter gauge. But um, when he was young, it was the 11 gauge to yeah. get that fat, clean tone. I wish in his period of the, the late 80s there, he would have got more notoriety for his guitar playing. I wish to. I mean, it's outrageous that, it, it, you know, it was all about the other stuff, not about his musicianship sometimes, about the... the go ahead. Right, right over my shoulder, that he said that in that room. Um, it was probably 84, and um, one of the major news magazines had done a story on him. It might have been Time or Newsweek or something like that. Or I don't remember what magazine it was, but it was a big national publication. And he was sitting at the console. It's... Studio 3, and he had the magazine open, and he was reading the article out loud to us. By us, it was me and Peggy and Wendy and Lisa would have been there. And I'll never forget this. He was reading. It was a really sweet moment. You know, he's proud. He's proud. And he was reading, and and it said something about this keyboard player. He described him as a keyboard player. And I remember he had the magazine down, and he looked up, and he said, nobody ever talks about my guitar playing. And he looked back down, and I thought... Oh, another thing I remember in that same article, it said, he read it out loud, the diminutive singer. Diminutive? Why do they call me diminutive? And uh, Wendy says, how tall are you? And he said, I'm <laughs> 5'3". <laughs> okay, well, that's a little diminutive, you know. <laughs> but nobody said anything. Gosh, I, I will put up a shot right now, but him s- just sitting there. And those magazine. are the moments that are almost more precious than even the record making. Yes, and Dylan Dresdow, who engineered with him in the 2000s, said something brilliant that I've never forgotten. He said, when it came to Prince, the things you remembered were the ordinary everyday things. Yeah. Because every single day in the studio with Prince was so extraordinary, the extraordinary stuff became the norm. And what you remember is... He said, watching basketball with Prince, eating a sandwich with Prince, you remember that stuff. And it certainly was the case for me. I remember getting in his uh, convertible Rolls Royce, the two of us, and driving around. We'd go out there to the parking lot, get in the car. He'd drive, and we would drive around Hollywood listening to work in progress. Just riding in the car with Prince. And it didn't matter to me, that we were in Hollywood and that we were in a Rolls Royce. So what? Uh, in a car, you're in a city. So what? What mattered was that music that's coming out of those speakers. Is it working or isn't it? Yeah. Is it working or isn't it? It was always about work. Apparently. Always. Yeah. Wow. He had a, one of the highest w- work ethics. One of the most uh, high isn't the right word. One of the purest work ethics I've ever seen. It's crazy. Mm. Wow. Okay, I have to know, where was The Beautiful Ones recorded? It was here. Yes. I, I'm, 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 I hesitate for a moment because we ran through it so often at rehearsal at home. St. Louis Park was the warehouse at that time, and we had recording equipment hooked up. So I remember doing recordings of 
of uh, Computer Blue and the beautiful ones. Yeah. The canonical version, the version that appears on the record, uh, by the sound of it, was done here. Yes, and that's what your book confirms yeah. to yeah. you, correct? Yeah. 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 I think Bobby Z said a great quote about that. He said, the beautiful ones is what you get when you put Prince in a studio by himself for 20 hours. <laughs> and I mm. thought, that's kind of nice. He it does was, mm. vocals, bass, electric piano, synthesizers, drum cymbals. Uh, what else is going on? But that vocal. Yeah. So he did his vocals. It's well known by Prince fans that he did his vocals entirely alone. And it was Peggy McCreary. I'm sure she told you the story of how she set mm-hmm. him up mm-hmm. to learn to record alone. But be in that lounge there on the other side of that door because those doors aren't that thick. And when you'd hear those soul preacher screams coming through that door, you just knew. When I walk through that door, he walks out, and he, he'd take a break, of course, after that vocal performance or any vocal performance, and he'd have you fiddle with the mix and do what you wanted to do. You were going to be alone in the room with that record. You're going to be alone in the room with, in some cases, something that just blows your hair back. I never lost that feeling of awe during those moments. Yeah. One of the things I enjoy about listening to you, because I could listen to you all day, mm-hmm. is there is an awe, there is a respect and a, you, it was like, I think you said before, every day was like, when he said fresh tape, you were going, hot diggity, there's going to be something new that's... It's going to be exciting. That to me is is like, you're such an interesting interview because of your interest in this. Thank you. you weren't going into this jaded. You are going into this as, bring it. Bring I was it. going into it, yeah. to it as his fan. Yes. I had seen the 1999 tour. I, I saw Dirty Mind at Flippers, right down there, La Cienica and Santa Monica Boulevard. It was a little roller skating uh, club. It was Flippers, and it was the Dirty Mind tour. And standing room only on the floor. And I, I just, I just, I, I was such a huge fan. I had all his records, of course. And to, it was, dream, I mean, to come to work for him, it was a, dream come true to work with your favorite artist and that comes off with what you say i mean your 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 demeanor everything and then when you tell a story you're you're basically Thank living you. it and giving it back to us and i, I love that about the way you describe there, these things. well i'm i'm trying to do him justice because uh, to use his own words those kind of cars don't pass you every day mm-hmm. and uh, uh, for the folks who are prince fans or even prince admirers they know that yep it's it you're not telling the true story of Prince unless you're talking about how amazing it was that's to amazing. watch him work. That's amazing also that you do say yes to every interview because it needs to be relevant and stay in algorithms on YouTube and new people that are coming up as musicians, engineers, they get to learn and there's all these different audiences that can, you know, absorb this information. So that's very much appreciated as a Prince fan myself Thanks. that you take the time to you know, whether the podcast is giant, small, big, now you have this book coming out, which we're going to get into, but you take the time, both of you, to educate, you know. Thanks to you. From a researcher to to somebody that actually worked with him, uh, sharing that information. It's just like this show. We're all just trying to learn. Dwayne and I are uh, both of the mind that we're going to do the best we can to keep his legacy alive. He was an important musician. He was an important American Music would be different if he was alive right now. Yeah. He's the Imagine what he would have done during the pandemic. Ugh. To have been able to do his... He was already in isolation as it was to be able to just have come out with an album in a week to say, you know what, this is what I think everybody's feeling right now. And to be able to do that and with the distribution that he could have now. It's just, it, it gives me goosebumps thinking about the lost conversations we have with him, the things he could have said that would have been profound. I mean, I look at Sign of the Times and how Sign of the Times predicted so much about how people were going to be, and I just think there's, it's just sad when you lose somebody in mid-conversation. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I think that's the big thing. I think he was still, could be as relevant as possible. My, you had mentioned something earlier about kids not knowing this stuff. My daughter's 12, and she doesn't know for Prince. She's heard Manic Monday and a few things like that, but we were in a bank, and she said, you know, the guy said something about whatever it was. And my daughter said, my dad writes books. And he said, well, about what? And she said, about Prince. And the guy said, oh, I heard Prince on the radio once. And I'm like, I, I, I was mm. glad there was thick glass there because I wanted yes. to choke yes. the guy. Because yes. I'm like, no, there's there's more than just the song you heard on the radio. There's a there's such a tapestry of, of music he had, both, you know, the stuff that you hear on the radio. But if you go exploring in his stuff and you can find things that almost every 
album or there's always he has something for every emotion you have if you're sad he's got these that are perfect if he's got if you're melancholy or if you're happy there's a song that kind of will accentuate your mood and and there's something intimate about the way he sends that to you and i think when you've said this before when he's in the studio recording his vocals by himself it's so that he's unfiltered going to his mm -hmm. his fans and listeners there's no engineer sitting between them there's it's just him and the microphone going right to their ear and yeah. i think that there's a you know he's not ashamed he's not hiding he's just, he's He's, well, he's hiding, he's, but he's like, oh, I'll tell you the secret right now. And he's like, that's yes. what he's doing. And I just, you hear that. And you go to a concert of his, and so many people think, oh, he's singing to me. I mm. heard him sing. He looked over my direction. You know, and there's, there's a, you got to see this stuff up close. The rest of us could just experience secondhand. But, boy, when you tell these stories, it just helps make it firsthand. Thank you. I believe he was a very honest lyricist. He didn't do a lot of interviews. What he wanted to know, wanted you to know about him, he wrote in his lyrics. And I, I do believe that the mitigating factor determining which songs would appear on albums and which songs would end up in the tape vault were the lyrical content. Yeah. He chose his lyrics very carefully at the time to uh, establish his identity at that time. He was, uh, I manage a, an artist named Carmen Vandenberg, and I always say to her, um, you're a true artist. I think there's people that release music, but then there's true artists where mm -hmm. they can not just do music, they can write poetry, and everything they do is just a, a cool, creative thing that is not better, but just more impactful, I guess. Mm -hmm. And that's what I, even if Prince wasn't a giant megastar, I still would be obsessed about learning about a true artist like him. And that's why people want to learn these things that they don't already know and they want to see how he worked and like your book seeing exactly what he did in these days um and who was involved and what it's, it's the, gear it's, was used because yeah. you want to yeah you're affected by it you're, well i feel the same way about bowie exactly you know it's like i, I look at bowie's art and i'm thinking oh, the guy probably paint the guy knew this and the guy and you're going wow this guy had a, a, a fingers and everything and same with the prince i mean i i love his you know i would never wear the clothes he created but look at what he did he made that, and it wasn't just a costume for him. This is what he wore all the time, <laughs> you know? And, and uh, there's something about the art he would do, and, and every album saying, I'm going to do something different now. Okay, that yeah. was my statement here. And I think the other cool thing you were saying about the, uh, um, what he wanted to say is he could have a great song on an album and then say, this doesn't work. It's not this working doesn't work in, right now. in this yeah. context, yeah. and I will take it and try it here, or it'll sit on the shelf, or it'll be a B-side. And you look at his B-sides, his B-sides are as good as anybody's A-sides. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, it's just, it's phenomenal when you think about how much, and then you get like the 1999 box set or the Sign of Times box set, and there's so much additional stuff, and you're going, yeah. that's a good song. Well, that's a good song. Well, how come he never came out? There wasn't, you could only come out with an album <laughs> a year, and then he had the time, or the Apollonia, the family, to do all this stuff. But think about, I, I think about the, the beginning of 80, 1984, where he did the rest of Purple Rain, the Time album, Apollonia 6, family stuff for uh, the Bangles. I know I did that next year, but all that stuff within like six months. That's, that's it's outrageous. That's four or five full albums yeah. of stuff that he did and would say, this isn't for me, but I want you to sing Jungle Love. I want you to sing this. I want you, you're just going. That's hyper creative. Yeah, that's insane. <laughs> that, and it's, it, when, you, when you see it, you recognize uh, most humans don't think this way. Yeah, the, the, something I did find cool about going through the studio sessions is that he would do, sometimes he'd be inspired, like he had a deadline for something, and he'd still be inspired to write something else, and you say, I'm going to do that song, it doesn't really mat, fat, fit what I'm doing, he'd do it to get it out of his system. But I also looked, and if you look at the end of every month in the books, you could tell he almost had a deadline at the end of the month, he said, okay, i got to wrap this stuff up, I'm going to final mixes that were happening and I didn't notice this until like the last day or two of the month to get things done almost as if he's got somebody saying we need this by the 30th and, okay mm -hmm. we'll finally do it and he does it at the 30th like he was waiting because he was mm. wanting to get this done I, it's interesting to watch his pattern of when he would do things in chunks and mm. things like that but like Peggy I think and you've also said is you never knew who it was going to be for when you started doing it sometimes it'd be like that she didn't you know he didn't know yeah that, didn't that, know. that's funny yeah he, he, he didn't know he, he would create 
and then decide what the function would be after the fact. There's a moment in making a record where a record turns a corner. So you, you, when you start off, you're just putting clay on the table. You're putting the basic instrumentation down, and it's the melody and the harmony and the counter melody, and these are the lyrics. But there's a moment, and I love this moment, when you finally know what the record is. It's been born enough that you finally recognize. Now I know what sort of record this is, because you're inventing as you go along. And once you know what it is, take some of the pressure off, and now you polish it up to optimize it for your album or for the vault or for future purposes or for some other artist or whatever. Those, those, th those are nice moments, because when the pressure is off, that's when Prince would get a little bit more talkative. Nice. Uh, so after Purple Rain, there's one other song that I have to ask you about that I please, please say that it was recorded here. The Cross. Of course. That was done right here. Right there. <laughs> right there. Thank you. That's cool. I remember cool. that day. I remember wow. that day. Walk me through that day, please. If I'm remembering correctly, uh, Dwayne, you might know, I believe it was a Sunday. Uh, it probably was. There was a set of songs that I called his Sunday songs uh, because often his religious material was recorded on a Sunday. And um, he came in late morning, as he usually did, black Yamaha drum kit set up right there. The tape was up. He was in a damn good mood. Uh, he was happy. And um, rolled tape, you know, got behind the kit and played the drums. And at, near the end of the song, I thought, oh, damn. He's speeding up like mad. He's, he's going to want to redo this. Of course, he's going to want to redo it. But, you know, I'm not going to stop the tape. Kept the tape rolling. And he came in and I was surprised he came in because he sped up pretty badly, and which Prince didn't didn't do. He didn't normally go off time that egregiously. He just picks up the bass, <laughs> gets going on the other instruments, and it was a little bit like the ballad of Dorothy Parker, where I uh, I'm recognizing. Don't you know that that was wrong, right? He knew and he didn't care. It it it, it did what he wanted it to do, and I remember instrument after instrument, layering and layering and layering this song, and how happy he was with it it was one of the rare times where he was so happy with it and i'm thinking that it's flawed it's flawed i, I i'm thinking it's not even usable <laughs> for wow. that for that acceleration that it does and he loved it to this day that it puzzles me i think it would have had more power if it had stayed in time but it, it's it's a popular song of his right, and it, right. it's, a, it's a beautiful record a beautiful right. recording yeah is it that popular? I mean, a lot of people I know don't know about it. I was going to say, oh. popular with the fans, among, I think. Among and and live, it's an album. amazing song, oh, yeah. live. Because yeah. he, just, he just brings so much more into it. But yeah, that was never a single or anything like that. Gary, yeah, but yeah. Gary Clark Jr. did a version of it at the oh. Prince. Um, it was like three years ago oh. at the Nokia Theater. Okay. What she did the I remember that. Right, right, right. Saw it on TV. Yeah, yeah, and absolutely crushed it. But that's my f top two, three favorite Prince songs. What's your favorite? I mean, probably the cross. Okay, oh, that's fair. Gorgeous. That's fair. The beautiful ones, or I like songs. I've. I mean, it's just. Kind this of, must be a. Kick, this must be a kick for you to be interviewing Susan, Peggy, David Z, things like that when they come in and, and be able to be in the room when they're talking about these things and point to the, over there and then that, that's got to be. I mean, if you're years, fan, every Van day Halen and stuff like this, I've seen the people you've had with Van Halen and stuff like this. I can only imagine for a music fan like you. There's not a day that I don't drive through the gate and start thinking about, God, this is an awesome. Like, I know that feeling. And it's also, it's not like any other studio in the sense that it's, because it's independently owned, father-son right. operation. Right. Right. It's so untouched where like Peggy, David Z, or Susan comes in here and says, wow, it smells exactly the same. And I was like, that's what everybody yeah. says. When David Z sits at the console and he's like, if you get the back wall rumbling, you know you're doing well. I mean, those kind of things are the most special stories, history, uh, just the importance of that to them, to the studio. And it's like every room, every little bit of this place has a story behind it or has a purpose or has, you know, just some crazy kind of, I mean, I, I want to ask you about your bunny getting in the tape machine. Oh, dear. Yeah. <laughs> um, so The Cross was done on a Sunday it's one of my favorite songs. But let's get into Sign of the Times then, which we were about to talk to before. It's 86, 87. Prince has a big breakup with Susanna. He's kind of down. Rap music's becoming more uh, in the mainstream, mm -hmm. really becoming 
pop music too yeah, kind of in a sense yeah, um, a whole new style of a new style of rhythm a new style of melody yes what was the first track you worked on for sign of the times and we didn't always um because for prince albums didn't start and stop the way they do for gotcha. most artists you recorded constantly and as you're recording he's uh, conceptualizing what his next record is going to be. And when you put out an album, there's going to be a color theme that goes with it. On Sign of the Times, it was peach and black. There's going to be a look. There's going to be clothing. There's going to be backdrops on stage. So you don't know. So prior to Sign of the Times, it was Dream Factory for a little minute, and it was something... Um, Crystal Ball. It, Crystal Ball, yeah. There were, there were various uh, iterations of albums that never came to fruition. So I can't say what was the first song that we recorded sure. specifically for the Sign of the Times album. He was transitioning from the revolution to Sheila E. and her band. Sheila and her band were from Oakland. And Oakland has a specific East Bay, Tower of Power, yep. heavily Latin-influenced style of funk, which is different from New York and from the Midwest. Did he want that? Well, what, what is your opinion, take, or experience when the revolution... Uh, and him parted ways. It was complicated. Uh, I, and not being in the midst of it, of course, you're going to get better stories from uh, Wendy and Lisa and Bobby and Susanna and the rest. But um, having, I can, I can tell you what I saw from Prince's perspective and what it was like for him. It, there was tension at the end of their time together, real tension that was obvious. It wasn't as as warm and youthfully optimistic as it had been during the Purple Rain and Around the World in the Day and the, even yeah. the parade times. The, the tension started during parade and the, and the tension was growing stronger. Um, some folks were dissatisfied. Folks were working really, really hard and they were dissatisfied. And inevitably, you know, these are all young people we're talking about and young people change pretty rapidly. Yep. That's their, that's their job. Is to have more entropy than older people. So there, 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 there's those tensions. It was interrupting the work. Yeah. It, was, it was affecting him. It was making it harder, I think, for him to concentrate. And something had to be done. These tensions either needed to be resolved or we need to go our separate ways. And ultimately he decided to go in a separate direction from the revolution. Now you asked the question about Sheila and her band. My hunch is... That was the most convenient choice. And they're all great musicians, and he was going to make that work. She was someone he knew. And as I mentioned earlier about methodology and tools and keeping certain things constant to free up your creativity, working with musicians he already knew was convenient. Yeah. And, and, he, and expedient. He could keep working. But because Sheila um, and her band were different musicians from Wendy and Lisa and Bobby and Matt Fink, and Matt stayed for a while, um, Prince's arrangements had to change in order to showcase uh, different musical styles. So that, that put another pressure on him for Sign of the Times. He couldn't do the sorts of records that would be best for the Revolution live. He had to do records that were best for Sheila E's band live. Wow. Did you work on the, the Flesh stuff? Yes. So that was, to me, I, I think about this a bunch, is that was done in the beginning of 85 and it was Sheila, Wendy, Lisa, Eric Leeds, Levi. And it seems to me, I think Wendy or Lisa, I don't remember which one said it, is it almost was like it was an, in, uh, a, an audition hmm. that they felt like. that, And because within a year, Wendy and Lisa were gone, and Levi, Sheila, and Eric were all in the band solidly. Yeah. Which I thought was interesting, an interesting take on theirs to see that, that that would be... You know, not necessarily an audition, but they, she said it felt like that. And to, and to, you know, Prince coming from his, the childhood background that he had, um, had a mistrust of stability mm. and, and a mistrust of um, um, love and friendship, a, a, a mistrust of that because he didn't know it very well. Mm. He didn't expect it. He expected the rug to be pulled out from under him. So I'll pull out the rug before you pull out the rug. Exactly. Me. Wow. Yeah, that 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 just was in his nature, mm. and um, so that that was part of it. Why did uh, Bill Jackson, who was an, a Sunset staff engineer, worked with Prince for thirty days when Peggy was out sick? Where would you have been during that? When is this? Around the world it in the 80, day. It was eighty-three. Oh. Uh, you were you were. I don't think you were aboard yet. 
it was the end of 83, beginning of... I was... No, you were that's right. So she, it, that's right. It was, it was December of 83 and January 84. I don't know. She... Yeah. There was some... Um, She's always in my hair. He tracked. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, she did the, a, a version of that eventually. I, I yeah. remember doing. She's yes, always in yes, my yeah. hair at, at the warehouse. In fact, I remember him mixing it. And we were sitting there, and he's behind the console, and we had just finished the last overdub, and he had a, a scarf tied around his head, pale blue, <laughs> tied up here, you know, like the guys used to wear years ago. And, and I said to him, Prince, how can you be listening with something covering your ears? You got, you got to take that thing off. <laughs> they were working. She's always in my hair. Yeah, I, I I don't remember. So he would come out here for business often. As his management company was here, his record label was here, and I wouldn't always come on those trips. Okay. Uh, he would have me work with. In that case, I remember I worked quite a bit with Jesse Johnson at home in Prince's home studio, and sometimes with others. He'd have me doing things at home. Do you remember David Z being in Studio Two with Maserati oh, and I remember, yeah. Prince giving them the demo of Kiss? Yeah, and then we, him taking him yeah. back. <laughs> so we were working on something. I don't remember the song we were working on. Dwayne might know. But um, Maserati, a band that Brown Mark had discovered, yeah. had been signed to Paisley Park Records, and they had gone into Studio 2 with David Z, and they needed a song. They came over and they asked for a song. And Prince did something he almost never did. One, he stopped what he was working on. And two, he picked up his acoustic guitar because he rarely played acoustic guitar. And it was this horrible sounding ovation acoustic guitar. He liked the feel of it. And I would put up fresh tape or, uh, yeah, when we did uh, program the drum machine very simply, played that ovation guitar, wrote some lyrics really quickly, did a, a lead vocal and um, sent it over to them, sent the tape across the courtyard. Oh. And when they brought the tape back in, <laughs> they had layered all these backing vocals behind the guide lead vocal, and David Z had worked some magic on the sounds of that, of, that, of that record. There was the keyboard part that had been run through the hi-hat pattern to be keypexed. Keypex was a noise gate back in those days to give you the dun 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 So the hi-hat is opening and closing the keyboard track. And when Prince heard it, I remember him standing there and laughing out loud. And I remember him saying, I'm taking that back. I'm taking that back. He absolutely loved it. And I remember, uh, in my memory, uh, David and Mark were a little bit like, oh, you know, <laughs> yeah, that's fine. But now we're still going to need a song for this record. But Prince was utterly delighted with it, utterly delighted. Interesting that he didn't recognize it at the time he wrote it. He yeah. didn't recognize this could be a, a number one number hit. One hit. Yeah. That yeah. demo is on our YouTube channel, actually, mm. and it's got your voice in the beginning. And uh -huh. yes, you're like, ready? And you're like, ready. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, it's just an acoustic, yeah. you know, minute 30 demo, two chords. Uh -huh. But what a massive hit. What if no, you would let Maserati have it? I wonder uh -huh. what would have happened. Incredible. And it's really just the first, few verse, uh, first verse. I think David Z said that he came back later and said, uh, they came back and said, we need more music, more, more verses. And Prince said, okay, give me a minute. B -b 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 yeah, yeah. And do the next verse. And it's like, just, damn. that's, to me, the creative genius of this guy that he could just switch. I'm doing this. Oh, you want, you want that? Okay, here. And just, and could come out with something as, as amazing as Kiss. And, yeah. and almost as a throwaway. Yeah. That's the, the thing that's mind-blowing That to me. fountain never shut off. Jeez. Which can be draining for everybody around you at times, I'm sure. Draining for him, too. Yeah. Uh, you know, Todd Harriman tells that story of... Todd asked him in the studio, how do you sleep after doing something like that? And he said, that's the problem, Todd. I, I can't sleep. I can't sleep. Yeah. Jeez. Uh, take some fan questions. I got about 490... Uh, All right. Then. I always <laughs> like that. ...things to ask you real quick. Um... Susan, thank you so much for coming on. Why didn't Prince ever give credits for co-writes or for even engineering? He gave engineering credits. Oh. So early Dave, on, he didn't. Peggy, a um, lot of times, she was not credited. David Z was left off a lot. Yeah. A lot of song. Even By the time you got there. But then you were even left off of some of the credits for like Sheila's stuff because he didn't want yeah. Sheila, people to know that he hmm. was doing the Sheila stuff. We're true, true, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, you know, I don't know, uh, because I, I do know when it comes to songwriting, he often gave credit in order to let someone he loved earn some royalties. These songs that he had written entirely by himself, he credited other writers 
sure. has collaborating with him on. So he was funny about credits in that way. It was the public credits were part of his public image. Yeah. The other thing I've seen lyrics where he'll write somebody's name at the top as if they wrote it. And it's still his handwriting. And you're going, mm-hmm. well, that yeah. says Sheila or it says right. Brenda or whatever it is. And you're going, he just, you know, and look at the, the credits on the family album. They're all Paul mm-hmm. and, and Jerome and everything like this. And, it was part know. of the uh, fantasy yeah. Yeah. that he was putting yeah. out there. He, uh, David Z said something like, he wanted to make it seem like there was an army. Mm-hmm. And I thought that's really profound. Mm. Yeah. Susan, is it true that Michael Jackson offered Prince to have a feature on the song Bad? Yes. Yeah. Before he recruited Slash, the guitar player for that record, Michael Jackson invited Prince to collaborate with him and do a duet. Prince turned it down. And from Prince's perspective, that was a smart choice. Fans would have loved it, of course, but Prince recognized that Michael was inviting him into his home on his turf to do a battle. And you don't want to do a battle on your rival's turf. Prince was smart enough, having made that mistake once before, uh, smart enough to not do it again. And he he turned him down. We did find out recently, a little fun fact, that the Beat It solo by Eddie Van Halen was actually done in this room. Really? Steve Lukather, everybody, they were at um, Westlake. Board went down. Same reason Prince came here from Hollywood Sound. But uh, they did all the overdubs for Beat It, and the guitar was actually done wow. here. We found the work order, too. Oh, that's great. So it's amazing that we can have this vault of work orders to go through to see. But a lot of times, the things he would say he was working on, it wasn't even what he was working that on. That is very true. So yeah, yeah, that is very true because you'd ostensibly start your day to work on one title, and the paperwork would be filled out, and then he'd change his mind and work on something else. So it was hard to keep a, a running record of what he was doing. Yeah, that's, I'll tell you, that's one of the most tricky parts of any sort of book I've written is looking at this and going, I, I don't know what was done here, but you see something that says live or things like that, and you kind of start to piece things together because you look the next day and it had something. But yeah, there's always the possibility of, of him doing three or four songs and not even listed, you know. Mm. Susan, was Let's Go Crazy written the same day in rehearsal at the warehouse that it was tracked? I would like to say yes, but I believe the answer is no. Because I, I, um, I think I have seen the existence of an earlier demo sure. of that song. Dwayne, you're nodding. Is that possible? Uh, I, I think there's, another, there's a demo with him doing it. Yeah. So I I remember the day quite well of us uh, recording the song at the St. Louis Park warehouse through that console that we had just uh, hooked up. Uh, The prince had his rehearsal set up and the mics that were on the stage would feed a splitter snake, which would go off to two consoles, a recording console and a monitor mix console. And a long time, it's been a long time arranging all the parts. So the musicians all came up with their parts. And then they went home at the end of the day and he and I stayed and uh, recorded that guitar solo, and I remember it was my first time. It was my first time uh, punching in. I just joined him, and now I'm moving from the technician chair to the engineering chair. And so it was the two of us, and um, recording the guitar solo. And he makes a mistake, so he tells me roll back, and I roll the tape back, and he's here standing with his guitar on, and I've got my hand on the remote of the tape machine, and we roll back, and he says, um, "We're going to punch in." Okay, great. But I was new to engineering with him, and we're rolling along, and he's playing along, and I'm thinking, I'm not in record. Does he know I'm not in record? Uh, he's playing, and I should be in record. Maybe I should be in record. I, I, he didn't give me a signal, but he's playing along. And I just went, dink, and I hit the record button, and he reaches over and went, dink, and s- hit the stop button, and he says to me, who cued you? No, nobody. He said, roll back, watch my face, I'll cue you, and this is where we go in. And that started four years of my listening with my hand on the remote, watching his face. And we got really good at it because where he wanted to go in, he'd start to raise his chin and he's going to come down on the downbeat. And, you know, it's usually going to be at the end of a four bar, eight bar section. So he'd be playing along and I just had to see this by the end of it, a subtle shift in his face. And I knew on the one is, is where you go in, unless there's a pickup and then you go in on the four and. But yeah, that was, that, he didn't fire me that day. Uh, I lived to record another day and that was a really happy memory of doing this incredible piece. Incredible. Uh, I have 
one more fan question, but two questions I personally want to know, which Susan, David Z, Bill Jackson, the bed that was in here. Oh, yeah. Do you remember the bed? Yes. And that was on all sessions? No. It, it, well, once it was in, it was in, but, you know, it, it, it wasn't always there in the time that I was here. Uh, he also had a bed at the uh, Flying Cloud Drive warehouse at home. There was a small little room, and yeah. it was a, a mattress and a really cheap pink and white bedspread. Was the bed it, right here? And there was a bed here, yeah. No, but I mean in this. It was in this room, yeah, right, right, right oh, in here, as around. I recall. Okay. It was up against that back wall there. Yeah. No headboard or anything like that. It was just the, the mattress and a box spring and a, and a bed spread. Uh, he he liked lying on it to write, and I, I know he had said that he got it for Peggy so she could take naps. But how can you take naps when you're working with him? You're not going to take a nap. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he was on the couch in the, the, in the thing if you're going to take a nap. Yeah, and you yeah. want him to walk out of the room right, and find you right, asleep? Right. No, I don't yeah. think so. Did, did were you in here where there were weights? Weights in here? I don't remember weights. I remember them at the warehouse at rehearsal. Okay. I don't remember them okay. here at sunset. Somebody told me they were here. I don't know. Yeah. I don't remember that. Uh, Susan, how did Prince progress mentally, artistically, emotionally in the specific era that you were with him? Also, when was the last time you spoke with Prince? Okay, two questions. So the f first... Um, he progressed pretty darn rapidly. Uh, when I joined him, he was he was a star, but not yet a superstar. On the cusp. He was right there, and then shortly afterward, he became a superstar up there in the stratosphere. And I was with him as that plane reached that elevation and hit cruising altitude. And I was with him as long as it was still cruising. Uh, through sign of the times now the plane begins to descend afterward i'm taking zero credit for that but it just through happenstance happened to be that the years when i was with him he was um at the peak of his record sales um he changed very rapidly uh because he during that period he went from age 25 to 30 and um or thereabouts and that's an important period in a in a young rock star's life and music itself changed very rapidly so there were a lot of changes for him there when i met him in 83 i saw him wear jeans if you can picture this blue jeans i saw him in tennis shoes white converse high tops as i recall never saw him after purple rain never saw him wear that again the man mm. i knew was a star who came to this studio every day with his hair and his makeup and his perfume or cologne and his his clothes and his matching boots and by the end i believe he was a star who was contemplating the best way to be effective and relevant in a new musical world yeah that happens a... very rapidly in music he was a marketing genius. Like mm. even later on in the '90s and 2000s, how he would get people to the shows and how he would do his releases. I mean, it wasn't just an artist, and he'd give it away to the managers to figure it out. Like he was very instrumental oh, in yeah. doing there everything. Was this, and there was a second question there. When was the last time I yes. saw him? I believe it might have Sorry. been 1995 at Glam Slam in Minneapolis. I was on the road with Tommy Jordan over here, the band Gaggy Ta. We were on tour, and we went to Glam Slam, and he was there. That was the last time I saw him. I saw him several times after leaving him, but that was the last time. And he was there, and, and it was warm, and, and we talked. And he said he was going to New York that night, and he invited me to come with him. And I, I said, I can't. Uh, I'm, I'm on the road with a band. I appreciated the invitation. I always felt, um, you know, I've always felt this, this great affection for him, love for him. And um, that was kind of easy to do. I mean, not immediately after leaving him. There was, couple of rough moments there. He chewed me out for the most recent Wendy and Lisa album that he disagreed with, and it wasn't my fault. So <laughs> we had some tense moments. But after, after that, uh, it was warm and affectionate, and, and there was love there. Yeah. He had matured, too. Uh, and yes. And probably was tired a little yeah. bit. Yeah, yeah. And music had shifted so much from the 80s to... 95 to 2000 it's just has to be tiring to try to compete still and you know what's interesting with a lot of bands and this is my opinion and specifically with van halen and prince they did their greatest work here at sunset sound mm -hmm. like they did f 
Van Halen did five records here, and they're all the best-selling ones. It's for me, it's got all the hits on it. And with Prince, I mean, Sign of the Times, Purple Rain. I mean, I guess he did yeah. a lot of it in Minneapolis too, at those rehearsal spots and studios. Well, this but was until that Paisley era. Park. Yeah, until Paisley Park Studios came online in uh, June of 1987, this was his go-to studio, I and mean, this was his home base. Yep. There was nowhere else he'd rather be. He also came back here in the late 90s. Mm. He came back here for about a week or two in August of eighty of ninety eight, I think. He came here in two thousand twelve. Yeah, and did exactly. Lotus flower. Yeah, exactly. Mm. So he came back. He still wanted to come back here. I mean, yeah. there's a familiar and family thing about being here. I he think. did. Ta- he recorded a tape too for Lotus Flower with yeah. Bill Mims, who's my Is it crazy. I mean, the guy just. I mean, the guy could go anywhere and just kept coming here. This is just, this is his place. And then parts of Paisley were designed after what they had here. Mm. You know. All right, let's find one um, one more fan question. Who was Condition of the Heart about? Do you know Susan? I can tell you uh, who it's most likely to be. Susanna? As we said, yes, it seems like most likely it was Susanna Melvoin. This is this is uh, was a time in his life where um, she was with someone else. He had known her, been friends with her for a long time, uh, was really smitten with her, really, really smitten. And... Um, the lyrics suggest that this is true because uh, he says he met a woman from the ghetto who made funny faces, Wendy, just like Clara Bow. How does a young black American kid from North Minneapolis know who Clara Bow is? Huh. He did. He was a true artist. Woman from the ghetto who made funny faces just like Clara Bow. How was I to know that she would wear the same cologne as you and do the same giggle that you do? It just kills me to think about this song. I love it so much. It's my favorite Prince song. And when he says, I'm blinded by the daisies in your yard. What a line. That's yeah, great. That one gets me so hard. I can see in your face. Oh, you, yeah. It gets me yeah. so hard. Let's discuss... There was one other question that just came up there. It said, "Did Prince vote for Ronald Reagan?" And I, well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know that he ever, you know, stood in line at the voting booth and you know punched those hanging chads or whatever they are to vote. So I don't know if he voted for anybody. But uh, Prince was like a lot of Minnesotans. He was uh, politically, you know, on the liberal side, but he was personally conservative. Yeah. And uh, he, um, like men of his and women of his generation, terrified of nuclear war. And that's what that song, Ronnie Tucked to Russia, Before It's Too Late, is all about. Uh, he had faith that, that Reagan would keep us from nuclear war. So he may have. If he, if he voted, maybe he would have voted for Reagan. I don't know. Sure, yeah. Um, I just, that was in my mind when I was lifting up off my, my note. And I was like, mm-hmm. ah, let me ask that. That's kind of interesting. So let's talk about your book, which is... Uh, has a, a reference to the Prince line in When Doves Cry. Yes. And... I'll let you kind of share on how this got started, the process, and yeah. who's involved. In 2019, I was invited by a um, computational neuroscientist, PhD named Ogi Ogas, who specializes in co-authoring with folks. I was invited to write a book about music, and I said, well, I can't do that because I'm not a musician. I, I, my students know more about music than I do, but what I can write about is music listening because I've been a professional music listener pretty much my whole life. That's what an engineer does. It's what a producer does. It's what a music fans do. You're, you're, you're a listener. So we, I put a lot of clay on the table uh, about what I've learned about music listening from being a record maker and what I learned in grad school from getting a degree in music perception and cognition. The concept in the book is this concept of the listener profile and how acoustically we can all be hearing the same record, but mentally we're all listening to a slightly different record. The book talks about seven dimensions of music listening, each one of which can give us a treat of dopamine. It might be the lyrics. I just got choked up citing uh, I'm blinded by the daisies in your yard. Some records I listen to for 
their poetry. Now, there might be other records you listen to just for that groove, and you really don't care if the lyrics are even in a language you speak, if that groove is working for you or that melody is working for you. Maybe it's the sound design, the timbres. Maybe it's the style of the record. You, uh, some folks like their techno, their electronic dance music. Other folks like their, their folk or their reggae. In this book, I'm describing what our brains are doing when we're enjoying the music of us, your personal, private musicianship that only you know about that comes from listening. Wow. Incredible. Did you, did Dwayne help out on the book at all? Or no, I, I read it early on. Gave you but an early yeah, copy I, I, of and, it. And I, I, I was blown away by the, the, the direction it went into because it was something I didn't see coming, which was oh, made thanks. it even more interesting to me. But, it's it's got yeah. uh, it's got neuroscience in there and uh, findings from the field. It's got um, some print stories. It's got yeah, s- nice. examples from the studio, and it's got an awful lot of what I think most readers, uh, the perspective that most readers share. Most of us are non musicians, and our relationship with music is as a listener. That's our music. That's our our that's our our musicianship, and I'm I'm describing that the music of you. So that the reader will not learn what I like. It doesn't matter what I like. The reader will learn more about their own relationship with the music that they love. In the last chapter, I talk about how falling in love with a record is like falling in love with a person. It's not perfect. Not everyone is going to think that that person is great. Some might even look at you and go, yeah, really? I mean, <laughs> what are you thinking here? You can do better. But for you, that record hangs the moon. It's, it's, it's your favorite thing in the whole world. And that's a mystery. And, and it's, I'm glad that all of us have this unique listener profile because that's what gives us such a variety of music. There's something you do in the book that I really enjoyed is, is you talk about playing records where you have friends that you go, this is what I like and this is what I listen to. And you kind of swap things like, listen to this, this means something to me. You do that in the book specifically by saying, here's a song I want you to listen to. Go ahead and listen to it. I'll wait. You mm-hmm. know, and, and she basically says, come back once you've read, listened to the song. I'm going to talk to you about what I've gotten out of the song. Or yeah. I want to talk to you. you know, and that's interesting to me because I actually did this. I found the songs on YouTube yeah, and I was good. like, I've never heard this song before. Okay. And I liked, I liked understanding where our taste in music comes from. That to me helped me understand my thing a little bit more. Not only the music my parents had, but the things that spoke to me. And, mm-hmm. and not just spoke to me, stuck. Because we can listen to all kinds of things. All day. You can listen to radio all day. Three songs out of the day will stick to you. Why are they sticking? And that's what this is in the book. You know, after Prince, I had the great good fortune to meet and work with Tommy Jordan and Greg Kirsten of the band Gagita. And Greg Kirsten, of course, has gone on to a uh. career as a producer. And Tommy has been involved artistically with other things. But I remember the year was 1989, and he and I were sitting in my car in the driveway... And he said something to me I'd never forgotten. He said, Greg and I are interested in understanding what music is. And I thought, that's it right there. That's why I'm so attracted to working with you, because you're exploring very differently from Prince. Prince knew exactly what his music was. Tommy and Greg were interested in exploring and how far you could push music outside of its boundaries. How far can you change its shape and still have it work? That was hugely insightful to me. Over time, I came to understand that what music is is what happens up here in our brains in private when music functions for us. That's its life. It's made here in the studio, but it comes to life in the listener's mind. Wow. That's incredible. Where can we order this book? I need a copy. Oh, it's everywhere. It's on Amazon and barnesandnoble.com, and it's in bookstores. It just came out a few weeks ago. So. And the title again is? This is what it sounds like, what the music you love says about you. Is it, and there's a website, thisiswhatitsoundslike.com. Yes, we can correct. learn about yeah. it. Are you on social media at all? Do Not you do at that? All. Okay, that's good. No, I, I don't, I'm too old for that. <laughs> yeah. <I> mean, <laughs> marketing and stuff, people. there's a lot of uh, things that can be accomplished, but it is. Mm, I know. I, d- I don't know. I don't know how. 
you have to be cut from a, a certain kind of cloth to know how to use it appropriately. And if you don't know how to use it appropriately, you probably best stay away from it. But you're out doing book signings and things like that. You're I can doing, do things in public, tour, but you... doing things online, right, I'm, right. I'm hopeless with that. It's... We all have our strengths and weaknesses. And then, Duane, you have three books out? I have two books out. The paperback for the second book just came out. It's got a chapter from book three in it. Gotcha. Uh, and there the will book, be a third one. Yeah, there will be a third one. The, yes. um, the first book is 80, 1983, 1984, which is Purple Rain, Around the World a Day, uh, the Maserati stuff, Apollonia, The Time, things like that. The second book is 85, 86, which is Sign of the Times, um, Parade, this room specifically a lot, and... Uh, uh, leading up to about the release of Sign of the Times. It ends with him recording Wally in his home studio with you. Um, and the book basically ends with the breakup of him and Susanna Melvoin and the recording of Wally, and then not sure what's going to happen with Sign of the Times because the, the, the record company has said, mm, not sure about this three yeah. CD thing. We may do the two or maybe even one. And so it's, He's at a, it's at like at the end of Godfather 2 where Michael's sitting there looking out mm -hmm. at the lake and he's like going, you know, there's not an upbeat ending. Empire Strikes Back. You know, they're looking out the window and they're thinking, oh God, are we ever going to find Han Solo again? It's that kind of stuff. So, this, But the, the third book will be the release of Sign of the Times, uh, the Sign of the Times tour, um, Love Sexy, Love Sexy tour, Madhouse 16, uh, the release of the Jill Jones album, stuff like that. So Incredible. it's going to take a lot of time to do it. The, the thing that the fun thing about the first two books, and this is what I was going to say to you about what you do here with the podcasts, is there's a, a history to sign, uh, Sunset Sound that I think is so vital. And the person that helped me out with this is a guy named Craig Hubler. And I, you probably know Craig, um, passed away a couple of years ago. Um, I was recommended to talk to him from Peggy. I started interviewing Peggy in like 1990. And uh, um, she said, Talk to Craig, get my work orders from him. And I talked to Craig and he said, you know what, this seems like a good thing. And what he did was, he, this is funny because he, he took the work orders out and he cut off all the prices. Hmm. He said, you can, you can do with this what you need to do, just don't say what we charge. Right. And I was like, okay. So I just, I, I, and, and I always honored that. I always said, okay. And so he actually physically cut them <laughs> before he gave them to me. And I thought that was kind of funny. So I, over, over the, 30 years that I was doing this stuff, I was talking to him and, and uh, he would he would reach out to me when Prince was doing a session or things like this, or if I had questions, I'd come to him. And, and he kind of introduced me to a lot of the engineers. Some of them were still working here at the time in the early 90s, and I'd come in here in the evenings and talk to people when they were sitting here. And it was like, people like Craig, it's, it's sad that he passed on because he was such a good guy, but every time I did a book, I always went to him and said, do I have permission to use these things? And he would always sign a release because always every every interview I do for my books was Paul who runs the place or or Craig, um, or Peggy or you. You guys always got a release form from me that said, I understand that there's a book coming out with this and I'm totally, I always want to be as, as open and upfront about this. But the nice thing is this is how I feel like with these podcasts. It's what you're doing is the same kind of thing. It's like seeking the truth through the people who were there because you're not going to get a better story than the people who are in the room with yeah. Van Halen or Prince or Peggy was in here with Elton John, you know, all these different people that were here, you know, it's, it's insane how much music has been done here. So that gave me the, the chance to write a, you know, so far as 1200 pages, it's a love letter to Sunset Sound, which is in my heart, having listened to how you guys talk about, you know, Sunset Sound. And seeing the way you tear up when you talk about some of this stuff, mm. it makes me feel like, you know, this is, this is something. And I hope somebody writes a book about the Van Halen studio sessions, that kind of stuff, because that's, to me, this stuff should be out there. It should be known. It should be inspiring, inspiring performers and things like that who are learning. And, and uh, what better teachers than to have Prince or Van Halen or Elton John or whoever it is talking about this stuff, you know. This is what it sounds like. Let's support these books. Support this show. Put a like. Share this stuff. Like this is what should be gigantic on YouTube. And there's hundreds of thousands of views on these interviews and millions in some cases. And there's such a, a desire to listen to the stories and learn and educate and get the Prince vibe going. And but you have to help out. Like buy this book. Put a like on this. Share these podcasts. Like this is amazing content that 
you know, people tune into for 30, 40 minutes. I mean, this is Susan's life that's in a book. And I mean, I can't wait to read this. Oh, thank you. So, I'd like to leave your listeners with a final image. I would love that. Just dancing around in my head right now. Please. So you get a call from someone in the morning, your hotel room in Los Angeles, often the sunset marquee that says, you know, he's ready, which means get in that rental car and get down there. You get, you come here to this room, you set up whatever tape you might have been working on the night before, whatever you asked for, maybe even fresh tape, and make sure things are mic'd and routed, and you're there. And your ears open because you're listening for the distinctive click of his high-heeled boots. <laughs> Coming down, you can hear, you hear the gate clang, and you're wondering, is this him? And then you're hearing those footsteps on the cement, and you're hearing that, those footsteps on that floor. And this man walks in, and he's impeccably dressed. He always dressed well, but even better in Los Angeles than at home. He's impeccably dressed. He's got this scent, this perfume that was custom for him. He's got his makeup and he's got those hands, those musicians' hands. He comes in and doesn't say much, but this beautiful man comes in the room. His aura fills the whole place. He issues you a, a few simple directives. And in that moment, you know, off we go for another day, for another song. He never came in and sat behind that console and wondered, what should I do today? Never. He came in with a full tank of gas every time with a plan and with music in his head, part of the reasons why he was so darn quiet. There was so much of that going on. And you just basically facilitate this incredible process, the process of his head of creation. Sunset enabled that creativity. The, the, the technicians that you have working here, the equipment that does not fail. <laughs> Once you started, it just flowed. And I, I, our gratitude to this studio and everyone involved for enabling his work. That's incredible. I literally want to put B-roll up while you talk and make a <laughs> one-minute clip out of that and watch it every single day. We'll end on that note. Susan Rogers, thank you so much for coming in. Dwayne Tudal, thank you for thank coming you. in for, for all invite. your work Thanks, and for assisting these amazing people and everything they've done in their life. And uh, I wish you much success in thank you. Uh, your new journey Thanks. in life and everything that's going on. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Drew. Thanks, Dwayne. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> Thank you, tech crew. Yay. <laughs>